أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأراضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة بن الحسن العسكري فداه وارواح العالمين Brothers and sisters السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته No one in all of human history has been subjected with the same level of persecution and targeted harassment as that of Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib. Entire government departments were set up in order to undermine Ali and to tarnish his reputation. Empires would set aside budgets that would be dedicated towards the goal of using propaganda to lower the status of Ali ibn Abi Talib in the public eye. No one has ever received such a treatment that government officials would be tasked with ensuring that leaders of congregational prayers would begin and end their sermons by cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ibn Abi al-Hadid, who was a Sunni scholar, a man who wrote a commentary on Nahj al balagha he was a Mu'tazili scholar, someone who's highly revered. He says, لعنت لعنوا عليا على المنابر في المغرب والمشرق pulpits in other words platforms used by speakers the most important platform was pulpits more important than TV channels more important than websites and social media networks he says that these pulpits were used to curse Ali ibn Abi Talib in both the East and the West and everything in between. 70,000 pulpits were used to spread lies and misconceptions and accusations and vile statements against Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this comes from a Sunni scholar, not a Shi'i one. It was so bad, in fact, that Ibn Abbas says, I was walking, he came across a group of people who were sitting down with prayer beads, with masbaha, and the dhikr they were reciting was cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. He came across this group and he said to them, did I hear you curse God? They said, no, we're not cursing God. He said, well, did I hear you curse the messenger of God? They said, no, you're mistaken. We didn't curse the messenger of God. He said, then what were you saying? They said, we were cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, then my two earlier statements were also correct. Because I swear to God, I heard the messenger myself who said, Man sabba aliyan faqad sabbani, wa man sabbani faqad sabba Allah. Whoever curses Ali curses me, and whoever curses me curses God himself. Then I was right. You were cursing God, 
and you were cursing the Prophet of God by cursing Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imam al Hadi السلام, has a beautiful visitation and ziyarah known as a ziyarat al Ghadiriyyah. This is a special visitation that's recited when you visit the commander of the faithful on the day of Ghadir, which is an incredibly important ziyarah and a day in which millions flock to the majestic, glorious mausoleum of Amir al Mu'mineen in Najaf. May Allah make us all among them insha'Allah. Imam al-Hadi prescribed this ziyara for this specific day. In it, it's not just a series of salutations. It's not just praises about Amir al-Mu'mineen. Rather, it is a document and a manifesto of who Ali ibn Abi Talib truly was. The greatness of Ali, the great stances of Ali and indeed who Ali truly was. In that ziyara, Imam al-Hadi says, he says, Salawatullahi alayka ghadiyatan wa ra'iha. May God's blessings be upon you in quick succession, one after the other. Because God's blessings are the only blessings that could do justice to Ali that could give him what is due to him. Then he says, فَأَنَّا يَبْلُغُ الْمَادِحُ وَصْفَكِ Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, how could one who is trained in the art of flattery ever be able to flatter you and to describe you as you truly were? How could anyone ever describe Ali ibn Abi Talib and give him what he truly deserves and put him in a position that God wanted him to be placed in. And conversely, how could one who is trying to bring you down ever be successful? They tried. If anyone tried, it was Muawiyah and his gang. It was the Bani Umayyah and their ilk. They tried, they spared no effort <clears throat> to the point that Muawiyah gives 500 coins to Samarat ibn Jandab. He says to him, I have a favor to ask. He said, what? He said, I would like you to take a verse from the Quran that praises believers and attribute this verse to Ibn Muljam al-Muradi. And do the opposite of that with Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, which two verses? He says, the verse that says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ ابْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ There are those who sell everything they have in order to seek the pleasure of God. Take this verse and attribute it to Ibn Muljam, the killer of Ali. And as for the second verse, it's the one where Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَقْرَبُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَنْتُمْ سُكَارًا O you who believe, do not draw near prayer while you are in a state of intoxication. I'd like you to attribute this verse to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Samara said, how much do you pay? He said, 500 dirhams. He said, sure, I'll do it. So he came out the next day. He said, سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه I heard the Prophet say, that the verse which speaks of those who sacrifice everything in the way of Allah for his pleasure is about Ibn Muljam al-Muradi. And the verse that talks about those who are drunkards and who enter into a state of prayer while intoxicated is about Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this legacy continues to linger, brothers and sisters. It continues to exist to this very day. Subhanallah. Why do you think this vitriolic hate that we see in the likes of ISIS, in the likes of Al-Qaeda, in the likes of Taliban, in the likes of Boko Haram, in the likes of Al-Shabaab and others, why do you think they hate the Ahlul Bayt so much? Why do you think they hate their followers so much? 
When you see a crowd of worshippers, a crowd of mourners, people who are commemorating the tragedy of the day of Ashura, being targeted with suicide bombers, that dismember small children and women and adults, the old and the young, the man and the woman are not spared. When this happens in Afghanistan, when it happens to the Hazara community, when it happens in Iraq, when it happens in Pakistan, why do you think this exists today? Because this legacy was built brick after brick by Muawiyah and his ilk. Because they invested government budgets, as I said, in order to establish a culture that is anti Ali ibn Abi Talib. And if Ali ibn Abi Talib is now in the afterlife, if he is no longer around to be assassinated again and again and again, his followers are there and they're as vulnerable as anybody else. Why do you think that if a member of ISIS had a chance, he would spare none of us here? Even though they don't know any of the their victims. They don't know who they're killing. Imagine killing someone you don't even know. Who does that? What kind of monstrosity does it take for someone to do, commit an act of violence and an act of barbarism of that magnitude? They must truly be blinded by their hate towards Ali ibn Abi Talib and the children of Ali. Why is it that they would demolish the shrines of the Ahlul Bayt, the shrines in Samarra, the shrines of the companions in Syria and elsewhere. Why? This culture was created by the enemies of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But despite all of that, despite the systematic campaign of demonization, despite the repeated efforts to tarnish the, the reputation of Ali and the followers of Ali and the family of Ali. As that man said, he said, His enemies whitewashed and covered up his virtues out of envy and jealousy. His friends and followers covered up his virtues out of fear for their lives. There are so many countries in the world today where you don't dare claim to be a Shia of the Ahlul Bayt. I know people who have had to cover their identity as a follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib from their own wives and their own children. I met someone one day from a country that's known for interfaith har harmony. A country that is known for having multiple cultures coexisting within it. Malaysia. And he said, Sayyid, the only other Shia I know is my wife because I keep away from the limelight. I have no contact with anybody else for fear for my life and the life of my wife and children. This is the 21st century we're talking about. This is in 2019 and 2020. This is in a time when people should be able to freely express their religious identities and not have to live in fear of persecution. And so the lovers and followers of Ali have hidden his virtues out of fear for their lives, his enemies out of envy and jealousy, and yet, Allahu minha ma yamla'u bayna al khafiqayn Despite all of that, the virtues of Ali fill the horizon from east to west. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Because no matter how much you try, no matter how much the enemies attempt to obliterate and erase the virtues of Ali ibn Abi Talib, there are certain things you just can't hide. You can't. For example, how can you hide the fact that the first believer was Ali ibn Abi Talib. What do you do with that? How are you supposed to cover that up? Anyone who becomes a Muslim recognizes Rasulullah. And the next logical question is, when the Prophet delivered his message, who was the first person to believe him?
Historians say for, that for a lengthy period of time, the Prophet would lead a prayer inside the sacred mosque in Masjid al-Haram with only two people following him. One was his cousin Ali ibn Abi Talib, the other was his wife Khadija. For about six months, who was the first person to embrace the Prophet when he came off the mount and he went home and told the story of hearing the voice of the Archangel Jibra'il? Who was the first person to become a believer? It was Khadija, right? Where was Ali ibn Abi Talib? Ali was inside the cave with Rasulullah. Ali himself says in Nahj al-Balagha that I was there with him. I heard Tantanat al-Shaytan. I heard it when Jibra'il came down and I also heard the devil mobilizing his army, moving and shaking uncontrollably that this will be the end of me. This is the beginning of the end of the reign of Shaytan himself. And Rasulullah told me, Ya Ali, innaka tara ma ara wa tasma'u ma asma'. You can see what I see and you can hear what I can hear. He was right there inside the cave of Hara when the revelation was revealed to the Holy Prophet. How can you whitewash that? How can you erase that? Of course, they'll attempt to bend over backwards to take this virtue away from Ali by saying, yes, he was the first in general, but the first adult to become a Muslim was number one. It wasn't Ali ibn Abi Talib. In other words, subtly they're adding all these conditions. All these, you have to pour shampoo and then conditioner and then rinse and repeat over and over again before you can somehow twist this into having a completely different understanding and a completely different meaning. Ali ibn Abi Talib was the first believer whether you like it or not. If being a child prevented Ali from becoming the first believer, then it makes no sense for the Prophet to deliver that message to him. You can't whitewash it. There are certain positions that you cannot compete with Ali ibn Abi Talib, no matter how hard you try. How can you compete with him being the first believer? You can't. It's like saying the first person to ever climb Mount Everest was such and such. Right? Can you ever compete with that person? Can you ever be the first person to ever climb Mount Everest? You can't. Because once it's done, once someone occupies that position, it is occupied forever. And this is an accolade. It's an honor given to that person and no one else ever again. How could you compete with Ali being the one chosen by Rasulullah to be his own brother? in the fraternal bond that the Prophet made after migrating from Mecca to Medina, the pledge of Ukhuwa. Every Muslim speaks about this. Brothers and sisters, it's our fault that we don't talk about these things, that we don't highlight these virtues of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because imagine if someone else had been picked by Rasulullah to be his brother. We would never hear the end of it. If anybody else whether it was number one or number two or number ten, had been chosen by Rasulullah the way he chose Ali ibn Abi Talib. You've all heard the story. The Prophet started pairing people up. Salman with Abu Dhar, Miqdad with Ammar, Umar with Abu Bakr. And then when everyone was paired up, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he's waiting, he's polite, he doesn't make any objections. At the very end, when everyone's paired up, he looks at the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, aren't you going to give me a brother? He said, Ya Ali, laqad addakhartuk li nafsi. Oh Ali, I saved you for myself. You are my brother and I'm your brother. Allahu Akbar. Imagine if Khalid ibn al-Walid had been picked. Imagine if Marwan had been picked. Imagine if anybody else had taken that position. Wallahi, we wouldn't hear the end of it. But you can't compete with that. You can never be the guy, the man who became the Prophet's own brother. You can never compete with the fact that Ali ibn Abi Talib became the Prophet's son-in-law. 
that he married none other than the mistress of the women of the world, Fatima to Zahra. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Despite multiple proposals, people vying for that position, people competing to become those chosen to be Fatima's husband, everyone knew what Fatima represented. Everyone knew that Fatima was going to carry the lineage of Rasulullah forever. Everyone knew how much the Prophet loved Fatima. Whoever would be chosen as the Prophet's son-in-law would in fact be the de facto successor of the Prophet. Because the Prophet had no surviving sons. The Prophet only had three daughters, two of whom passed away, killed at the hand of treacherous men. And then the last surviving offspring of Rasulullah is Fatima. Fatima bada'atun minni. Man aadaha faqad aadani. Fatima is a part of my flesh. Whoever hurts Fatima hurts me. Whoever pleases her pleases me. Fatima tu ummu abiha. I was an orphan. I grew up without a mother. But Fatima is my mother. Fatima this, Fatima that. Rayhanati min al jannah. Mashtaqtu ila al jannah illa wa shamamtu riyaha. Whenever I yearn for paradise, I smell the fragrance of Fatima. What was it about this woman whose fragrance, whose scent was one of paradise? This was Fatima. Fatima was hawra'un insiya. She was a a celestial, heavenly damsel in human form. Her beauty, her stature, her position was undeniable. And so everyone wanted that position. And they tried, sure enough, one after the other. Ya Rasulullah, could I have the honor? Ya Rasulullah, I'd like to propose. And the Prophet kept telling everyone that, you know what, this isn't even in my hands. I am waiting the command of God as to who gets to marry my daughter Fatima. In other words, even I, the father, don't get to make that choice. God himself. This is one bond. This is one marriage that gets officiated in paradise before I get to officiate it on earth. Eventually, Rasulullah chooses Ali ibn Abi Talib. How can you compete with that? You can't. Which is why what you do instead is you try to whitewash it. You try to say, oh, you know, Ali ibn Abi Talib wasn't the only son-in-law. There was another person. We'll slap a title on him, calling him the Nurain, the one with the two lights, meaning he married both the Prophet's daughters. He married Zainab and Umm Kulthum. Sure enough, they died under very mysterious circumstances while they were married to you. Sure enough that after their death, Rasulullah said, I don't wish to see you. Which points all the fingers at the true killer of these two innocent daughters of Rasulullah. Most Shia scholars say that they were stepdaughters of the Prophet. I tend to believe that they were actual daughters of the Prophet, but that's another discussion for another day. It doesn't matter. What matters at the end of the day is that the way you try to take this virtue away from Ali is to say, well, he wasn't the only one. There were others as well who also married the Prophet's daughter. So what? But we didn't see people lining up in queues to marry Fatima, did we? To marry those two. Fatima was the one they were vying for. Fatima was the one they wanted. You can't compete with any of that. You can't compete with the fact that Ali was the father of Hassan and Hussein. Rayhan Ataya min al Jannah, Sibtai, the two grandsons of Rasulullah. Do you know how special Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein were? Let me share one example with you that I have never shared from the mimbar before. One day, Rasulullah stands, he's about to enter into a state of prayer. Imam al Hassan, excuse me, Imam al Hussein, who was very young, about two, three years old perhaps, he comes and stands right next to his grandfather. The Prophet raises his hands and says, Allahu Akbar. 
Imam al Hussein is trying to mimic his grandfather. But being so young, his speech hasn't fully developed yet. So he can't quite pronounce the words as well as he should. And so he says Allahu Akbar, but he doesn't get the words right. So the Prophet then says Allahu Akbar once again. He repeats the takbir so that Imam al Hussein can repeat the takbir and get it right. Imam al Hussein can't get it right the second time. The Prophet does it again. Allahu Akbar. Imagine all the Muslimin, all the congregation standing behind Rasulullah wondering what's happening. Ya Rasulullah, you doing takbirat al ahram multiple times just for the sake of this child to be able to recite the takbirah properly. The Prophet does it a fourth time, a fifth time, sixth time. On the seventh time, he says, Allahu Akbar. The young Imam al Hussein also says, Allahu Akbar. And they all enter into the state of Salah. Imam al Sadiq says, Because of that, it is now mustahab and recommended that when you stand for prayer, you say, Allahu Akbar, seven times. Because that is what Rasulullah did for the sake of Imam al Hussein. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. In other words, because of Hassan and Hussein, Rasulullah would make adjustments to his religion. How can you compete with the fact that Ali was the father of Hassanin? How? How can you compete with the fact that Amir al Mu'mineen was the one who defended not just the Muslims and their army? But Rasulullah himself in battle over and over again. How can you compete with the fact? And how can you deny the objective historical fact that in the battle of Badr, Amir al Mu'mineen was the one who killed half of the enemy, and as for the other half, he helped the entire Muslim army to kill them? How? Sallallahu alayka ya Amir al Mu'mineen. Just as Imam al Hadi says, he says, how can one, even a sworn enemy, deny your virtues, Ya Amir al Mu'mini? How can one be able to praise you the way you deserve to be praised? I'll give you one example, brothers and sisters, of how Amir al Mu'mineen, in this one singular act, was greater than everybody else. It's a story you're very familiar with, but I want to read from the Quran to build up to the actual act of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Try and contextualize it. Try and imagine just how pivotal the act of Amir al-Mu'mineen was. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals an entire chapter in the Quran. A surah dedicated to this incident. Surah Al-Ahzab. In this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the battle of Ahzab, also known as the Battle of Khandaq, the Battle of the Trenches, when the Holy Prophet, when faced with an alliance that was bigger than anything they had faced up until that day. This was a decisive battle, brothers and sisters, that would have brought an end to Islam altogether. And the Quran references this in unambiguous terms. Listen to this. In verse number 9, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O who you believe, udhkuru ni'matallahi alaykum, remember God's blessing upon you. What blessing? Ith ja'atkum junoodun fa'arsalna alayhim reeha, wa junoodan lam tarawha, wa kana Allahu bima ta'amaloona basirah. When an army combatants came toward you and we sent a wind upon them because on the eve of uh, the battle of the trenches after the original the battle that took place with Amir al-Mu'mineen and whatnot then there was a wind that came a sandstorm which forced them to retreat and go back and وَجُنُودَ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا And soldiers that you could not see. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرًا And God was ever seeing your actions. God knew exactly what you were doing. إِذْ جَاءُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ وَمِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ 
This army that came to you came from up above you and from underneath you, which is a, uh, a way to describe how this army was all encompassing. They came from every direction, from every angle. It illustrates once again that this battle was a decisive one. This battle was going to make or break Islam forever. As a matter of fact, Muslims had Medina and Muslims had built themselves up a bit, but the enemy had multiplied to such an extent that this is how God describes the onslaught. He says, they came from underneath and above you and there was nothing you can do. وَإِذْ زَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارُ وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرِ زَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارُ is a euphemism for when someone is so frightened that they no longer see around themselves. Imagine, just for a moment, God forbid, through that gate over there and the one over there for the ladies, we suddenly see a group of ISIS, black clad fighters and terrorists, stormed through these two entrances, right in the middle of this building. The fright, the sheer amount of fear that they create is, is going to be nothing but chaos, right? You will see people running to every direction. You will see children scream. You will see men, women completely lose their way. This is basically what Allah is describing. He says, Zaghat al-Absar, your eyes began to go up all the way into their sockets out of fear. Zaghat al-Absar wa balagat al-Qulub al-Hanajar. Have you ever been in a situation where you're so afraid? Let's say, for example, you've done something really bad and your parents have found out and they call you and you know what this conversation is gonna, how, where this conversation is gonna go. The fear that you have or you get called to the principal's office or whatever, the fear that you have will make your heart race so fast that you can feel your heartbeat in your throat. وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرِ You feel like your heart is obstructing your throat. You can't breathe. You start heart hyperventilating. So the fear made them completely lose their way. It made them hyperventilate to the extent that they felt like their hearts were obstructing their air canal. And what's worse than those two things is that you started to doubt your faith. You started to think, hang on a second, is this religion true? Is this prophet a true prophet? Because from what we can see, there is an ocean of enemy combatants that have come to completely obliterate us from the face of existence. This religion is about to end forever. Is God really there? Is He actually going to help us? How is He going to help us? How is this all going to work out? You started to say, Allah says there, that was the true test. When believers were tried and they were tested, and they were shaken, and they underwent an earthquake that Allah says shadida, a great shaking, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the day of judgment and he says, Zulzilatul ardu zilzalaha. The earth is shaking, the earth is shattering. Here Allah says zilzalan shadida because it's not a physical earthquake, rather it's a spiritual one. It made people doubt everything they had come to believe over the last 20 years. Since the inception of Islam, since the beginning of the revelation. And this is where the hypocrites started to actually speak to each other and reveal their true intentions. They started saying, ما وعدنا الله ورسوله إلا غرورا. All this talk about heaven, hell, about us becoming victorious, all that is nothing but idle talk, nothing but falsehood. It was all a bunch of lies. وَإِذْ قَالَ الطَّائِفَةُ مِنْهُمْ يَا أَهْلَ يَثْرِبَ لَا مُقَامَ لَكُمْ فَرْجِعُوا. People started saying, O oh people of Medina, O oh people of Yathrib, get out as 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 soon as you can. 
Don't stay here because this will be the end of you. فَرْجِعُوا وَيَسْتَأْذِنُ فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمُ النَّبِيَّ يَقُولُونَ إِنَّ بُيُوتَنَا عَوْرَةً وَمَا هِيَ بِعَوْرَةً إِنْ يُرِيدُونَ إِلَّا فِرَارًا God says that we know. We know how you started coming to the Prophet, coming up with all kinds of excuses so that you could escape and run for your lives. We've seen all that. وَلَوْ دُخِلَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ أَقْطَارِهَا ثُمَّ سُئِلُوا الْفِتْنَةَ لَأَتَوْهَا وَمَا تَلَبَّثُوا بِهَا إِلَّا يَسِيرًا In the midst of all of this, Muslims thinking this is the end, hypocrites thinking let's make a run for it, this shaking, this shattering, this earthquake, in the middle of all of this, Amr ibn Wid comes. He says, who's going to fight me? He started to scream over and over again. Will anyone come and face me? A man who used to be known as the defeater of an army of a thousand people. He could take on a thousand men and still be able to defeat all of them, kill all of them. So you can imagine if you have the slightest doubt in your heart, you do not face off with Amr ibn Wid because you know you're going to get killed. You know you're going to die. Ali ibn Abi Talib is this young man. He gets up, Ya Rasulullah, let me go face him. Instead of the Prophet actually giving him permission to go, because had the Prophet done that, had the Prophet from the first instant said to Ali, sure, you can go and fight him. Try your chance. Either you're going to go to heaven or you're able to do something. Instead of doing that, the Prophet told him, sit down, Ali, sit down. Amr. This is Amr we're talking about. Everyone knows who Amr is. Why did the Prophet do this? To give the rest a chance. Because had he given, given him permission, I'm sure there was going to be people who say, you know what, if the Prophet had only asked us, we would have been happy to oblige. We would have been happy to go and fight, but the Prophet gave it to Ali, so... The Prophet had Ali sit down. They were all sitting down. Have you ever seen someone who's got a bird standing over his head? Imagine like you're in the park or somewhere and there's a bird that somehow lands on your shoulder. You try not to move or hesitate the slightest bit. If you can stop breathing, you'll stop breathing because you don't want the bird to fly off. That's exactly how they were sitting down. Not a hiccup, not a sneeze, not a cuff in case that, get, that gets misconstrued as them volunteering to go. So then Ali ibn Abi Talib stands again, again Ya Rasulullah, let me go take him. So the Prophet says to him once again, Ujlus ya Ali, innahu amr. He does that three times, eventually the Prophet gives him permission to go. The Imam goes, he has a conversation with Amr ibn Wid. He says to him, who are you? Imam Ali says, I am Ali. He says, Ali, who? who's your father? He said, Ali ibn Abi Talib. The moment he said that, Amr had heard about the bravery of Ali in the battle of Badr and Uhud. Amr had heard rumors about this young man who was the Prophet's secret weapon that somehow turned the tables around in every single battle. Ya man qad ankar min ayati Abi Hassanin ma la yunkar. إن كنت لجهلك للأيام جحدت مقام أبي شبر فاسأل بدرا واسأل أحدا واسأل الأحزاب واسأل خيبر من دبر فيها الأمر ومن أرد الأحزاب ومن دمر من هد حصون الشرك ومن شاد الإسلام ومن عمر قاسوك أبا حسن بسواك they compare you with others, O oh Abba Hassan. How can you ever compare a tiny speck with a mountain? They can't even be compared to the slippers of Ali's servant Qambar, let alone with Ali himself. This is who Ali ibn Abi Talib was. And so Amr ibn Wid had heard rumors. For the first time in his life, he was afraid. So he said to him, you know what? I don't want to kill you. Go back to where you came from. Because I knew your father, he was a good man. 
Adi said, well, here I am. Let's face off. And let's see who sends who to the afterlife. But this is not fair. You're sitting on the back of a horse. You can't do that. How about you get off your horse so that it's an even playing field so that we could fight together. Amr ibn Wid was so proud and arrogant and was filled with such hubris that he immediately jumped off of his horse. He used his sword with a single strike, cut off the legs of the horse and said, fine, let's go fight. A few moments, as soon as the dust settles, Ali ibn Abi Talib is standing triumphantly over the dead body of Amr ibn Wadd al-Amri. Muslims are watching all of this. Imagine the fear, the sheer fright, the terror that had taken over their hearts is now immediately transformed into sheer pride and happiness that Ali has now saved us. Ali ibn Abi Talib. And it's the moment where Rasulullah says, Darbatu Aliyin, a single strike of Ali. Not the prayers of Ali in the middle of the night when he would go off in his farm, away from prying eyes, away from the public. He's not looking for the limelight. He's not looking for anyone to praise him. La taziduni kathratun nas. He's the one who says that no matter how many people surround me, I will never feel proud and happy because people are with me. And no matter how many people abandon and desert me, I will never feel frightened or abandoned because my connection is with God himself. He would go off in the middle of his farm to pray. He would twist and turn as he prayed toward his creator like one who has been stung by a snake. Inshallah, you would never get stung by a snake, but they say that a snake bite is like when your entire body is on fire. You don't know where the pain is coming from. And so the person twists and turns and moans. Ali would be seen that way every once in a while as he prayed to God. Not the prayers of Ali, not the charity of Ali, not caring for the orphans of Ali, not the justice of Ali. A single strike of Ali is greater than the acts of worship of the Thaqalain, both the jinn and the ins. That is who Ali ibn Abi Talib is. How are you going to compete with all of that? How can you cover up the Quran which sings his praises? This book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every time Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, Ali ibn Abi Talib is at the top of the list. Ali ibn Abi Talib is the master of every mu'min, every mu'mina. This is who Ali ibn Abi Talib is. I'll share a story with you, brothers and sisters, and wrap up. One day, Amir al-Mu'mineen is walking in the marketplace. This is when he was the emperor, when he was the leader of 50 of today's countries, one of the biggest empires history has ever seen stretching all the way from West Africa to the Russian Republic of Dagestan. All this was under the domain of Ali. But what a domain this was, that he says, if a goat trips over and falls because the bridge wasn't done right, I hold myself responsible. Anywhere, in the far stretches of this empire, if any act of oppression takes place, I hold myself responsible. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So he's walking in the marketplace. He sees a woman holding a basket that looked heavy. So the Imam walks up to her and he says, could I carry this basket for you? So she says, thank you, Ya Abdullah. Oh, servant of God, she doesn't recognize the Imam, obviously. So she hands him the basket. He carries it. Qambar, who was with the Imam, he says to him, Ya Amir al muminin let me carry the basket for you. He said, Oh, Qambar, who's going to carry my burdens in the afterlife? You won't be there to carry that for me. Let me carry this myself. 
So the Imam takes the basket, walks with this woman. As they're walking, the woman says, you know what, thank you. I didn't think a stranger would come to my help. I am a widow. My husband was killed because Ali sent him to one of his wars and he ended up dying there. And look at me now, no one cares about me. I don't have any helpers, I don't have any support. Amir al-Mu'mineen keeps on carrying the load, doesn't say a single word until they get to the house. When they get to the house, he hands the basket over to the woman. She opens the door, the Imam notices a number of orphans, little children playing in that house. And so the Imam goes away. Qambar says that Ali did not get a single minute of sleep that night, all night long. He kept speaking about these orphans, this widow, the children, the people who had been abandoned. He didn't get a single moment of sleep. As with daybreak, the Imam gets up, goes and gets some food, and fills up a basket, goes over to this woman's house. He knocks at the door, she opens the door. He says, Ya Amat Allah, O servant of God, I have brought you some food for the children and I'd like to help you feed these children because I noticed that they were hungry. So the woman says, thank you, come on in. He goes inside, he notices the children are hungry, they're starving and they're also orphans so they have no father, no one to play with them. So the Imam says to the woman, would you like me to cook while you entertain the children? She said, no, I'm a better cook than you. You can stay with the kids while I cook a meal for them. So as she's cooking, the Imam goes to the children. He acts like an animal, has the children ride on his back and walks around the room, has these children entertained and acts in a playful manner with them until the food is prepared. Before that, the Imam says to the woman, let me light the fire, let me light the stove. So he goes to light the stove, the stove. When he lights it, there is a fire that blows in his face. As soon as it blows into his face, the Imam says, Dhuq ya Ali, taste the fire, O Ali. This is the punishment for those who abandon orphans and children. So the woman then brings the food, they sit down, the Imam begins to feed the children with his own hands. And with every bite, the Imam says, the woman isn't seeing this, she's not hearing this. The Imam says, pray for Ali, ask God to forgive Ali. And he feeds the children one after the other. As they're sitting down, suddenly a neighbor of that woman, she comes in. As soon as she sees Amir al-Mu'maneen, she recognizes him. She goes up to the woman and says, do you know who this is? This is Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is Amir al muminin This is the king. This is the emperor. So the woman goes straight up to the imam and she says to him, Wa hayai min kaya Amir al muminin I am so ashamed of you, O commander of the faithful. And the imam responds, Bal wa hayai min kaya amat Allah. I am the one who's ashamed of you, O servant of God. My apologies if I've ever had any shortcomings, if I ever neglected you. And so the Imam then walks out, he says to Qambar, I am now delighted that when I walked in, the children were, cr were, not, were crying, but now they're all laughing and they're happy and they're filled with joy. Ali ibn Abi Talib had a special relationship with orphans. That's why he was given the title of Abu al-Aytam, the father of orphans. Rasulullah in fact says, Ya Ali, Ana wa anta abawa hadihil ummah. You and I are the fathers of this nation. Have you noticed when you go to Najaf, when you visit the shrine of Amir al Mu'mineen, you're at peace. You feel the sense of tranquility and serenity. And part of the reason is your home. This is our father. This is Amir al Mu'mineen. This is the loving father of the orphans. And we are all your orphans, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. Especially on a night like this. It is the month of Ramadan. These are the nights when we commemorate the tragedy of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And our cry and our call to the Imam is that we are all your orphans, Ya Amir al 
Al-Mu'mineen. He was so kind and compassionate towards the orphans that when he was taken to his home as he was wounded by the sword of Ibn Muljam, one narrator says that I came to the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib. I noticed that there was a long line of little girls and little boys, each one of them holding a cup filled with milk. I said, why are you here? What are you doing? They said that we heard that the physician had said it is good and beneficial for Amir al muminin to drink milk. So we brought this milk from our home and they were all saying, take this milk, just give us our father Amir al muminin <laughs> Take the milk and give us our father back. Allahu Akbar. What a compassionate father they had. Amir al Mu'mineen was, in fact, so compassionate, so kind and merciful that when they brought Ibn Muljam to him, his own killer, his own murderer, do you know who Ibn Muljam was? Ibn Muljam was a slave. Amir al Mu'mineen went and bought him from his master. He paid money to release him and, to, and make him go free. He then, not only did he allow him to walk free, but he gave him a little bit of money in order to help him build his life, look after himself. The Imam looked after him, the Imam treated him as he did with every orphan, with everyone who was needy. And yet Ibn Muljam turns around and does this to the Imam. When they brought him in, the Imam struggled to open his eyes. He looked up at Ibn Muljam, he said to him something that breaks my heart, brothers and sisters. He said to him, Was I such a bad Imam for you? What did I do that you would turn around and do this to me? And I say tonight, brothers and sisters, lest there be a day, God forbid, that Amir al Mu'mineen looks at me and says, was I such a bad leader? Was I such a bad Imam? Why would I, what would I, why did I, what did I do that you would turn around and become this source of shame for me as a Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib to bring shame to, the, to Ali ibn Abi Talib? That's how merciful the Imam was, Allahu Akbar. The orphans were lined up. The Imam was surrounded with his children, with his family. Then he became, then he started to give his final instructions to his children. He asked everyone to leave. All the strangers, all the non-family members were asked to leave, except for Hassan, Hussein, Zainab, Um Kul. Abbas, the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib were the only ones who stayed. The Imam spoke a few words to each and every one of them until the very last person to speak was Zainab. Zainab looked at her father. She didn't have the courage to ask him the question. Instead, she spoke in coded words. She said to him, Father, I only have one question. Is the story of Umm Ayman true or not true? What had Umm Ayman told Zainab? Zainab didn't have the heart to say, Ya Abata, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, will Karbala happen to us? Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, is it true that my brother Hussein will be slaughtered whilst thirsty? Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, Ya Abata, is it true that the hands of Abbas will be severed? Ya Abata, is it true that they will kill Ali al Akbar, Al Qasim, Ali al Asghar? She didn't have the courage to ask all of these questions. Instead, she said, Ya Abata, is the story the tale? of Umm Ayman true. The Imam cried. He looked at, her, at his daughter and said, yes, my daughter, the story and the tale of Umm Ayman is true. It will all happen. So have strength, but worry not, for Abbas will be there to protect you. Allahu Akbar. I say, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, at this difficult time, at this difficult hour, when you are leaving 
leaving this world. How lucky were you to be surrounded by your children, to be surrounded by your family. وَلَكِنْ لَا يَوْمْ كَيَوْمِكَ يَا أَبَا عَبْدِ اللَّهِ where were you, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, when your son Aba Abdullah opened his eyes? He looked around. Instead of his children, instead of his family, he looked around. Imam al Sadiq describes the people who had surrounded Aba Abdullah. He says, Fafirqatun bisuyuf. A group were wielding their swords. And there was a group with their spears ready to attack and launch them at the heart of Aba Abdullah. And there was a group who had no weapons, no swords, no spears, so they carried sticks. And there was a fourth group who had no sticks, so they carried rocks in their hands. Aywa wa wa musibata. 30,000 of them ambushed Abba Abdullah from every angle. Zainab was standing on the cliff. She was looking down at the killing pit. Zainab couldn't do anything, so she placed both her hands over her head. <laughs> ya Rasul Allah, Jadda, Hada Hussein Kabil Ara, Maslubul Imamati Warida. مذبوحون من القفا لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين يا أرحم الراحمين We all have needs, we all have prayers, we all have wishes. These are the nights when you call upon Allah ten times. The hadith says the response will come, Sal abdi, O my servant, ask and you shall be granted. يا أرحم الراحمين عجل اللهم لوليك الفرج والعافية والناس With these broken hearts, tearful eyes, make the prayer that will bring about an end to suffering and carnage insha'Allah اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج اللهم اجعلنا من أصحابه وأعوانه اللهم بحق مولانا أمير المؤمنين اجعلنا من شيعة أمير المؤمنين اللهم أحينا حياة محمد وآل محمد وامتنا ممات محمد وآل محمد ولا تفرق بيننا وبينهم طرفة عين أبدا دعاء الفرج إن شاء الله recite it with your loudest voice بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك
وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين إلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات ومن مات من هذا الجمع وإلى أرواح الشهداء والصالحين والعلماء وخدمة أبي عبد الله الحسين نهدي ثواب مجلسنا هذا وثواب سورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات